Good. Well, thanks very much for the invitation to speak today. Um, we're interested in learning agency or action outcome associations. And we're interested in how this can happen in a, an opportunistically driven way where there's no overt reward, um, just for the fun of it. And here's a small child having some fun. <coughs> And we think here he's surprised about the, the outcome there. He doesn't know about candelabras and candlesticks. And he doesn't know how this works. He hasn't built up an internal model of what's going on here. So he has to do it again. How does it work? No one's giving him sweets. And again. And again. And thank goodness for YouTube, eh? Otherwise, where would you get your material for your presentations? This goes on for about 20 minutes <laughs> on the original. And, and, and that would have got me off making any more slides, but um, I guess I've got to show something a bit more than a cute video, yeah? So we're interested in, in how this might work. So what do we think is going on here? Well, as I said, uh, what we think is going on is he's trying to build an internal model of causality, uh, some sort of associative neural network that's going to glue together representations of action and sensory context, do this with these things, <coughs> and, and the outcome comes apart. Uh, and, and so in the world then, he's got to be presented with that action and context and the consequent outcome repeatedly uh, to ensure associative learning. And um, the physics of the world will ensure that if he does the action in the context, the outcome ensues. Uh, and, and so it comes down to a problem of action selection uh, in terms of having to bias our policy, if you will, to, to repeat the, the action given that context. And uh, this is where we think that the basal ganglia will be important in, in this, uh, this situation and governing action selection. The internal models could be anywhere else in the brain. I'm not going to address that particularly today, and so I want to focus in what follows in, in uh, this notion of the basal ganglia and its bias of policy to, uh, to repeatedly perform the relevant action to learn these internal models. And so just to rehearse enough of the story, enough of the background here to understand what comes later, we imagine that sensory and cognitive state information tend to um, prime or initiate some nascent actions in cortex which then send requests down to the basal ganglia in action specific channels. Uh, the basal ganglia as you're probably aware exerts tonic inhibition on its targets and here this, uh, this action request has a weak salience as I will term it, a weak salience and the tonic inhibition has <coughs> not been removed. As a result the thalmocortical loop can't engage in any sensible reverberatory feedback activity and that action is not selected. In contrast, if there's a strong stimulus to initiate another action, this will result in a large, uh, a high salience for this uh, action request and um, the inhibition will be released on the target and this uh, thalmocortical loop can reverberate with a positive feedback loop, cortex becomes highly active and can engage with the uh, motor resources. So, uh, th these things are obviously uh, anatomically uh, co-localised, but there is competition between these. And the other point here, just to, 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 bring you, uh, to give you the take-home message, this notion of salience for action requests coming in from cortex to the relevant basal ganglia channels. Okay, so um, that's how we might select actions which are already uh, in existence and already encoded in basal ganglia, but what we want to do here is to try and understand how actions, new actions are learnt in basal ganglia. And the problem is this, that we could have an encoding of some nascent action up here. It could be sending a strong request down to the basal ganglia, in particular the uh, input nucleus, the striatum. Um, <clears throat> but how will the basal ganglia respond? Um, it needs to respond properly to this action request if this action is to be deployed. And we use this metaphor here of shouters and listeners. Yeah? He, he can be shouting very loudly, I want to do this action now, but if he isn't listening, nothing's going to happen. Um, more formally then, um, 
uh, I don't need to explain this to this audience, but basically it comes down to matching uh, synaptic weights from cortex to the striatum. Um, here I've got a random agglomeration of weights and inputs. It forms a, a neural activation, if you will, of, uh, of a third, whereas here, when they're nicely matched, I get a strong um, uh, response, okay? So it's, it's not rocket science, this is just uh, uh, in a product of, of, of vectors. But um, the point here is that corticostriatal plasticity, the where, that is the, the, the nexus of the cortex and stri striatum, where these weights occur, is going to be the locus of action learning in the basal ganglia. And we know that for this plasticity to uh, work, we need um, dopamine. We need the neurotransmitter dopamine. And the story goes something like this, that here we have uh, cortical neurons firing away, here we have input uh, the input nucleus of the basal ganglia, the striatum, with so-called medium spiny neurons here. These are the synapses that we're interested in and we know phenomenologically that dopamine is critical here for this um, plastic change. So then that asks the question, what causes the release of dopamine in basal ganglia? <coughs> um, possibly one of the most uh, cited pieces of data and, and, and uh, one of the most popular slides in basal ganglia circles is this thing here um, from Wolfram Schultz's lab. This shows um, Recordings from dopamine neurons where you have a rewarding stimulus uh, and if the reward is unexpected you get a nice vigorous response. You can transfer that response to a conditioned stimulus here where the unexpected um, reward predicting stimulus uh, is what triggers the dopamine response. And indeed if you omit the reward, so you have an unexpected omission of reward, you get a small dip in the uh, dopamine response here. Okay, so the oft-cited um, hypothesis is that dopamine is a reward prediction error. A short while ago we, we examined this hypothesis closely and it looked at the timing involved and it uh, appears that uh, the phasic dopamine occurs very soon after the stimulus, uh, well before any visual evaluation of the reward. And so um, could it be that dopamine is not signalling reward, uh, but, but what is it signalling? Now by reward here I mean uh, this word is a reserved term by the biologists with a lot of ontological baggage. Uh, in conversation with my um, partner in crime here, Peter Redgrave, it took me a while to, to understand what he was getting at. For me, coming from a more machine learning viewpoint, reward is little r in your algorithms. Yeah? It's the term on the left-hand side of the, uh, of the equations. I just couldn't see what, what's the problem. You know? uh, and then he regaled about 17 criteria that have to be satisfied before something can be called biological reward. And it started to realise what he was... So by reward here, I don't mean anything you like on the left-hand side of the reinforcement learning algorithm. I mean specifically the thing that the biologists use this reserved term for. So it needs evaluation, it couldn't be reward in our viewpoint. So we propose that it's a sensory prediction error and that it's, um, it's all about unpredicted salient events which may be neutral or rewarding in the biological sense. So our hypothesis then is at this critical time just here, this young chap gets a little burst of phasic dopamine coming from his um, substantial nigra compactor. Well who knows, but anyway that's that's the hypothesis. Okay. Well, it's a bit uh, tricky dealing with um, ethological situations with children, um, and so we, we commandeered a slightly easier situation. Uh, this work was going on at the same time as we were developing our, our model, and uh, it's, it's an experiment with rats where they're in an operant chamber and they're habituated in the dark for three days, and the chambers have got two poke holes or snout holes. Uh, with a stimulus light, but during the habituation phase nothing happens when they stick their noses in the either of those holes, nothing at all happens. But then after uh, a certain number of days uh, the, one of the uh, snout holes is assigned an active status and when they put their snouts in this hole uh, you get a light response, a neutral light response. 
And the key thing to note here is this was working on a so-called variable interval schedule, which means that this is not a reliable outcome. So sometime after the first initiation of this, there'll be some random interval where there'll be nothing on this uh, nominally active uh, snout hole, and then there'll be another response, and so on. Yeah? OK, so here's the experimental data. Um, uh, this is not in our lab. This is in uh, uh, Gannett's lab. Yeah? Um, and so during the habituation phase, the, uh, this is time along here. This is the number of interactions in a 30-minute period. And the active hole and inactive holes shown by dark squares and, and, and open squares, respectively, the number of interactions is roughly comparable and there's some mod moderate uh, habituation over the entire three-day period. But then as soon as you turn on this active phase of the experiment, um, the uh, number of responses into the active hole, the one that elicits the light, increases and then declines somewhat as the experiment is progressed over several days. The these, these are um, uh, times in days here. Yeah. In fact, they're, they're two-day blocks, so that's uh, 16 days. Uh, and so you get this characteristic elevation of response into the active hole. Uh, and there, just for the record, is the response during a single day uh, broken down into small um, six-minute epochs. So there's some habituation within the day as well. OK, so um, as I say, coincidentally, we were developing a task which, um, while it wasn't initially modelled on that scenario, turned out to be an exact replica of that scenario. We didn't have <laughs> snout holes, but we had a small uh, mobile robot which... Um, could elicit, elicit light flashes by bumping into a particular coloured cube. It knew the difference between red and white, that's all. And um, roamed around this arena, <coughs> arena bumping into these cubes uh, and was reinforced for doing this one and not this one. Yeah? Um, so the light flash causes phasic dopamine in our model and uh, we have a, an internal prediction model of when this light flash will occur. Just to understand what the status of this thing is, so on, on the left-hand side here, we've got a load of robotic stuff, um, hardware, sensors, cameras, and so on, and wheels. On, on the, I say left-hand side, on the right-hand side, we've got the, the core model, which includes all our stuff about basal ganglia, corticothalamic loops, <coughs> um, predictions of uh, the phasic stimulus. This is the stuff we're interested in. This is the stuff you need to test this hypothesis. Uh, and, and of course we need some glue in between as well, uh, some motor stuff and perceptual stuff, which we're not particularly interested in as modelers here. This is our, our hypotheses have nothing to do with perception and motor uh, competence, and so these are purely engineered competencies. So in particular then, in that right-hand box, we've got um, our thalmocortical uh, loops and our loops through basal ganglia. And I'm not going to go into this now. It doesn't, it's not essential that you understand the minutiae of this for this talk. And uh, in particular then, our model of basal ganglia looks something like this. The, the main thing to draw your attention to here is that striatum is divided into two neural populations which preferentially express either D1 or D2 type dopamine receptors. And it's here that our um, learning rules are going to be applied. If I get time, I'm going to come back to the learning rules, OK? Um, so that's where the, the plasticity is going to occur. This is the site of interest here. So we, in, we, we started off by thinking that plasticity could explain that pattern of data. There it is in, in uh, small form, just to remind you. Um, and, we, and we imagine that this might ensue as a result of sort of LTP weight strengthening, yeah? But it turns out that that is not the case. We tried a range of learning rules uh, with and without phasic dopamine. And yes, you can get some elevation of uh, behaviour here in our robot. So it's exactly the same scenario as the, the rats and nose poke, but surrogate here with uh, red and white cubes, yeah? Um, but we thought this, uh, this, this, this increase in behaviour was a bit lame, yeah? it wasn't really what we were looking for here. So um, we thought this, there's something else going on. Uh, just to remind you, this is a variable interval schedule once again. And so we, we were forced to resort to a hypothesis that goes something like this. Um, it's kind of obvious in a way, but you know, we tried to focus on this plasticity thing for a while. 
and, and, and we hypothesize that object and features in the environment associated with surprising phasic um, outcome acquire salience, so their sort of cortical representations become big, um, and that therefore uh, they become intrinsically interesting and attract attention. We were forced to this viewpoint, having ex exhausted the plasticity route. Um, and just to remind you then, red cubes for the robot correspond to snout, active snout poke holes for the rats. And the, um, the red cube then acquires intrinsic uh, interest for the, uh, for the robot. Um, and then the novelty salience is going to diminish as the outcome be becomes predictable. Uh, and we wanted to model this uh, notion of prediction governing the uh, novelty salience. And the internal prediction is also going to shape the dopamine signal because it's about, uh, it's, it's about sensory prediction error. Okay? So this prediction model is, 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 uh, is important as well. So here then, uh, to, to illustrate this prediction model, I've got a graph of the, the signal of the light, which is, uh, which is binary. It's either 0 or 1. So, so the light either occurs or doesn't occur. Uh, and, and also on the same axis, the uh, prediction signal, I've called it Y star here, which is a continuous scalar. So you start out at the beginning of the experiment when uh, you have no prediction that there's going to be a light flash at all. Why should you? Yeah? You've been in a darkened environment. But then the first light flash occurs and you make a prediction. Then maybe there's some, some reason to think that when I touch the red cube, a, a, a light flash occurs. So your, your Y star signal, your prediction signal, is elevated a little bit. The next time round, though, remember this is a variable interval schedule, um, there is no light flash. There it is there. Uh, and your prediction signal is uh, decreased as a result. And the whole thing then plays out over time. You sometimes get light flashes, you sometimes don't. And so the, uh, the prediction signal wanders up and down in response to this thing using some simple exponential um, model. It's, n it's not um, very complex. We then transfer that prediction signal uh, like this to produce a novelty salience. Basically, we say that when you are most uncertain, so the prediction is 0.5, when you are most uncertain, the thing has max or the, 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 the objects that cause the, the light flash, the red cube in this instance, um, acquires a novelty salience of maximal value. Here we've given it a value of 0.5. It's, it's somewhat arbitrary. Okay? But the point being that when you're most uncertain, the novelty salience is largest. When you're completely certain about the outcome, the object is of no uh, uh, attentional importance at all. That then drives, so, so transferring this graph through that graph, we end up with something like this to get the, the time series of novelty salience. And directly from the uh, difference between uh, Y and Y star, the signal and its prediction, we get this uh, sensory prediction error. It's roughly like the, roughly the difference of this. There's some scaling normalization goes on, but it's roughly the difference between Y and Y star. Uh, and so this is going to drive our uh, phasic dopamine. This is going to drive our salience of the, uh, the red cube. So now we start to get things that look a little bit more like the, uh, the real thing. Here's our response with no phasic dopamine, driven entirely by the novelty salience, obviously. Um, but with, with uh, phasic dopamine, we get an interesting result. First of all, uh, the entire um, mean activity is dropped a little bit. Yeah? So this, is, this is the mean activity in the active phase. It's smaller than this one. Uh, and we also get the shaping of the uh, time series, which looks a little bit reminiscent of the shape of the uh, time series in, in the data. Uh, and so the plasticity is actually doing something that, that, that helps us mimic this data here. Uh, well, just for good measure, there's the within day um, time series too, but I don't want to draw too much attention to those just now. Okay, so um, the reason for this then is if you look at the weights, the, the, the corticostriatal weights that are being learned here, uh, with no phasic dopamine, they just, they just carry on and don't do very much, they kind of stabilise around here. But um, in, in this uh, pathway with uh, striatal neurons uh, expressing preferentially D1 type dopamine receptors, you get a decrease in the weights in the, with, the, with the phasic dopamine. And in the other pathway, you get um, uh, an increase in the weights. And uh, I think it's Michael who's emphasized this story that this pathway may have something to do with no go, stop doing actions. And so uh, these two things kind of work 
together quite nicely and, and, and A, um, cause an overall decrease in response but also shape this thing over time. It's a sensible thing to do in response to what the animal, or not the animal, in this case the, um, the robot is confronted with because the variable interval schedule means it's fundamentally unpredictable. It's potentially informative, but you really don't want to spend the rest of your life trying to predict something that is not predictable. You know, the most information-rich displays are, of course, visual white noise. Hugely information-rich. Sorry. Let's, let's, let's decode what? the visual information. Yes, yeah, sorry. In fact, in a variable interval, yeah. if you let time pass, yeah. then it becomes predictable. So after, if you if you restrain from responding, then the probability that it will actually act well, my understanding was that in the experiment, and, and in, indeed in our, um, uh, our mimicking of that experiment, the, the probabilities are carefully sculpted. So that I know what you're saying, that, that if you haven't seen something for three, three minutes, you're likely to see something now. It's going to come up. It's, yeah. If you don't go. It, yeah. My understanding is that the, the probability uh, function here is carefully sculpted so you can't do that. So that at any point in time, it doesn't matter where you are in time, your knowledge of the probabilities is no greater by just sitting there uh, and, and, and trying That's to do the it, task. Yeah, yeah. If you reset it in every visit, that would be the case. You're always at yeah. the same time ahead. Yeah. But, but my understanding was that uh, the, the PDF here is carefully sculpted so that is not the case, that you can actually. Um, it's not, st it's not state dependent in terms of time. It's, it's the animal is confronted with the same thing at every moment in time. Yeah. Okay, um, so how does that play out in, in detail then? Well, here's a, a graph of the, uh, si similar to the uh, thing I showed earlier, where I showed the light um, either being off or on by the little red markers here. The prediction signal is in the dotted black and the novelty salience is in green and you can see um, because it's close to 0.5 you're fairly uncertain about what's going on here which causes a high novelty salience. The green signal is, is uh, not zero. It also causes a large prediction error uh, which is either positive or negative but actually there are more dips and bursts here because the animal is... I keep calling it the animal, it's a robot for God's sake. Yeah? Um, <laughs> is hitting the red cube, light goes on, no light, no light, no light, light goes on and so on, yeah? So um, there are more dips and bursts which causes in the no-go pathway this elevation of, of weights, okay. Then we came to look at the uh, situation that in some senses we were more interested in because just like the, uh, the video with the small child, most of the time the world is predictable, the physics are reliable. It's only in somewhat highly contrived situations like variable interval schedules in labs that, that uh, that's not the case. So um, doing the same experiment now where we have a reliable outcome, the light comes on every time you interact with the red cube, uh, there is a, an elevated response on the first day with no phasic dopamine, but that response is increased now, not decreased, increased and maintained with uh, phasic dopamine. Now when we did the model, um, the, the guys around the uh, rat experiments with the uh, snout poking had not done this experiment, and uh, we'll come back to that later, but uh, just to explain now what's going on, um, the graphs are much simpler now because the, the, the prediction rapidly increases. It saturates at one. You, it's, it's utterly predictable what's going on here. The light's always on. The, the novelty salience goes down. Yeah, so soon predictable, low novelty salience, small prediction error. And you get these bursts of phasic dopamine very early on. There's, there's a zoomed in view so that you can see there are a few of them. It's not just one. Yeah? Um, and that results in a massive increase in the corticostriatal weights which cause that increase in, in behaviour and they stay large so that causes the um, sustained uh, response uh, after the first couple of days. Yes, so here is the predictions tested. Here, here's our model and I've drawn the graph again uh, with this uh, omitted uh, connecting line here because that's how the, uh, the other guys do theirs. So, so this is the graph you've seen um, and as I say Around about the time we published this paper, they'd actually done the experiment. So it was nice to see that the, the prediction was, uh, was, was uh, validated here. Um, 
uh, compare that then, there are, there are differences here, compare that with the variable interval schedule, notice that there is this monomodal increase and decrease here like there is here. H here the, uh, the response reaches a maximum on the first day and then declines but is sustained, reaches a maximum, declines but is sustained. So qualitatively then uh, we think there's good agreement with the, the data. So in summary then, the, the learning of this, this agent in the small robot is that uh, we wanted, in some sense, plasticity to account for this, this was our story, but it, wouldn't, uh, it couldn't account for the data in the, in the rat experiments, the nose poke experiments, and we introduced this idea of novelty salience uh, to help. Uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay. Um, in the fixed ratio schedule, which we think is the ethologically normal situation, uh, this, this repeated bias to execute the, um, uh, uh, the action could be mainly due to novelty salience. But we still need phasic dopamine to enable us to learn the plasticity uh, that's required for the, the listener, the basal ganglia, to sculpt its weights to listen to the cortical uh, request. Okay, given I've got 10 minutes, I think I've got time for the other half of my talk, which I wasn't sure whether I would, yeah, so... Um, I've mentioned nothing at all so far about the, um, the learning rules, and uh, hopefully I'll try and put that right now. We wanted the learning rules to, um, to reflect the uh, biological uh, reality to, to, as far as we could, and um, there was a parallel stream of work going on at this, this time, uh, which meshed with the robot story um, on corticostriatal plasticity. And the problem is that this, this topic is, um, is hard, okay? It's complicated because plasticity rules can vary along three dimensions. First of all, I've introduced you to this idea of there being two types of medium spiny neuron, depending on their receptor preference for dopamine. It's also going to depend on the level of dopamine in the system. I think you've got this idea of phasic dopamine, increase in dopamine, dopamine dips. Yeah. And if you look at the level of spiking, then it's going to depend on the timing uh, between the pre and post spikes. Yeah. Um, are at least some of us familiar with spike timing dependent plasticity? Hands up those people who are good. Yes. I'm not saying. Okay. So uh, before we try to recruit this. Um, the point being, I'm not going to give a tutorial on spike timing dependent plasticity, I'm afraid. No. Uh, before we tried to recruit this, th this, this story into our robot, we, we actually tried a, an, an enormous number of what I call ad hoc rules in trying to um, uh, get the, the agent to work well here. And it was surprisingly hard to do it consistently across all the experimental conditions. And so um, we want to be guided by the biology here. What does it look like? Well, a short time ago, um, there was this study in science um, coming out of Sermeyer's lab where they managed to tease apart the responses of the, um, the two types of medium spiny neuron, the D1 and D2 type uh, neurons, um, using some clever uh, techniques. Um, and also uh, employed a variety of techniques to, to investigate the effects of dopamine depletion. And so we've actually got all the cells in our matrix filled in by this data. It's really quite nice. So I've abstracted some of the uh, raw data here. This shows uh, D1 medium spinies in the high dopamine condition. Okay, and this is a, an LTP experiment. So um, here we see elevated um, uh, excitatory postsynaptic potentials as a result of, of this uh, condition here. And I inferred that to mean that in the sort of classic uh, STTP way of fitting an exponential kernel to this, you've got this positive quadrant here uh, in the normal way showing LTP. Yeah? There he is again, just for reference. But here's the thing, if you do the same experiment with um, uh, low dopamine, sorry, with, neg with negative timing, with negative timing, you, you get a non-statistically significant result or a weak um, LTP, LTD there. If you now go to a dopamine lesion condition and um, uh, repeat the, the whole thing again, uh, for both positive and negative timing you get this um, 
uh, LTD uh, thing going on, which is you know anti textbook. Here's the textbook result. Well, modulo this. Uh, the, these are not like the, the the textbook results. If you now look at the D2 medium spine, is you get a somewhat sort of uh, canonical um, uh, response here for positive and negative timing but you get a non-canonical response which is the antithesis of the uh, D1 response for positive and negative timing with D2 in a sense. So the whole thing looks a bit of a mess. Uh, two things. First of all we need to interpret that behaviourally but first of all we need to um, uh, come up with a hypothesis about what happens at intermediate levels of dopamine and the, and the hypothesis goes something like this that basically you just take the two extreme or you take those STDP kernels and you imagine that they are at the extremes of a, of a spectrum of dopamine and to get somewhere in between you just morph one to the other. Uh, having had a training in physics I believe in the fundamental continuity of the world you know this funny stuff doesn't go in between it just migrates smoothly from one to the other so linear interpolation or linear combination of the two extremes gives you this sort of surface plot here in the, in the pale blue lines you can see the um, the, the, the STDP kernels I showed before this is for D1 this is for um, uh, low dopamine, yeah, this is going down like that. So you morph this, this blue graph into that blue graph at the back and that's what you get is this sort of continual uh, series of responses. And at tonic levels you get something that does look a little bit like the textbook, yeah, with LTP and LTD. To do the same for D2 MSNs, you, get a, you can play a similar game there, you get another graph and um, the interpretation goes something like this then, that when you have phasic uh, bursts of dopamine uh, in D1 neurons you get large LTP action learning at the behavioral level. Um, in contrast um, <coughs> when you have dopamine dips you, know, you want to try and uh, undo what you did earlier um, and therefore you have a sort of action unlearning here. Um, for D2 neurons you get this sort of mixed response, this sort of classic textbook thing which to cut a long story short, it does help the, the selection in our basal ganglia model. And for uh, the, uh, when you have phasic dips, you want this no-go pathway to be strengthened, which is what you get here reliably, irrespective of the STDP timing. Okay, so uh, yes, tonic levels allow normalization and consolidation, as they normally do, of the plasticity. Uh, there's an extension to the story, which I haven't got time to go into now, about using eligibility traces rather than just STDP, but hey, I'll talk about that later. Uh, so that was a, a, a parallel story, but we recruited it to be used in this robot situation, and, and here we were using the, the Beanstalk, Cooper, Monroe, or BCM family of rules, this sort of um, enhanced Hebbian type learning, if you will, clever Hebbian learning, and uh, the way it gets introduced is to modify this, uh, this factor here that crops up in the BCM formalism. So this is now dopamine dependent and uh, depends on dopamine like this for D1 neurons and like this for um, D2 neurons. And so in sum then we've got this uh, scenario where uh, our behaviour can make contact with uh, in vitro data about uh, plasticity at medium spiny neurons. We've got our robot running around here but in the, in the heart of the model we do have something based on these um, in vitro experiments uh, through this shenanigans here but then transported into uh, rate coded land I should have said if it wasn't clear all our models in the agent running around here are rate coded neurons they're not um, spiking neurons okay uh, and that then makes contact with the behavior as uh, described in the snout um, experiments in the rats so uh, we've got this mo model of policy change, repetition bias for action discovery. Uh, plasticity alone can't account for the data. We introduced this notion of novelty salience. It can predict the fixed ratio schedule's results. And uh, we still think that uh, corticostriatal plasticity is essential for this, this, this matching, this, this listening um, ability of the basal ganglia to its action requests. Uh, and our rules are based on... Um, uh, in vitro data. So the rules are complex but they're unavoidably so. I don't think biology gratuitously makes things complicated. Um, 
was it Einstein said a model should be as simple as possible but no simpler. Um, I think biology is as simple as it can be but no simpler. So um, the rules are just the rules yeah, in order to elicit this kind of behaviour. So I'd just like to acknowledge the people who helped on this work. I've mentioned Peter Redgrave, Mark Humphreys, uh, Rafino uh, built the robot model and all the other people in the research group of course and, and some people who were kind enough to throw money at us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So is there experimental evidence for this novelty salience that you introduced? Oh, there's a slide which I um, <coughs> cut in this presentation, which because uh, I, di I did uh, ask that question myself, and I, I went looking for uh, the, the evidence for this. And there's some old experiments on um, with humans on eating, where people are sated and then they're given some new food stuff they've not seen before and it suddenly becomes interesting for them whereas you present them with the, the food that they've seen up to now and it remains uninteresting so there's a kind of hint there I think that, and I think that the authors of the paper say there's something about the sensory experience of the new food stuff which makes it more interesting for people so just, just some possible link there with the data yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, um, but I was wondering about the shape of the Function that, that you assume. So it, the fact that it peaks at 50%. Oh, uh, uh, I mean, I, yeah. I might have drawn a priori that uh, salience is a declining function. The, the novelty salience, uh, you, ooh, am I going to get to it here uh, through all, this, all these animations? Yeah, uh, eventually. Right. Yeah. That one. Yeah. So, right, there is evidence from the oddball paradigm, and in rare events, mm -hmm. I would have thought it would be straight. So here's a rare event. Um, we had one light flash, and that was enough to cause um, an increase of the novelty salience to nearly 0.5. Right, but it that just depends on the more salient. Then, as probability goes up, the salient should go down. I mean, that's. You could imagine a function like that, but that's still better. So you're saying that if the if I'm certain about one outcome or the other, then no, there would be uh, yeah. So as long as there is, if if your the probability is very low, and you see something like if it's the first. That's right. This one here, yeah. 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 Then it, it might be maximally salient. It is. It's, it is almost maximal. It's point. It's 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 point. Four there, in which a, is in a graph there. It's maximally salient at fifty percent. So what I'm saying is that no, this is this is the sorry, this is the prediction. This is the prediction value. This is so it's a little bit uh, counterintuitive. So, so, so. Um, I either I'm either very sure that there's a light, or I'm very sure that there's no light. Oh. Yeah. Uh, if my prediction is anywhere in this intermediate zone, I'm completely unsure about what's going on. So it, it, you're right. In the first, in the very first instance, I, I was very sure that I was in the dark all the time. I have this one event, which then initiates a big. Um, uh, there's, there's a sort of exponential step decay, step decay thing going on here that initiates. Um, the, uh, this okay, and then as you yeah. accumulate observations of that light, does the salience go up? As you accumulate, as you accumulate observations, your prediction will, will, will uh, if the light is reliable, and as you accumulate observations, this is what happens in the, in the, here, as you accumulate observations, um, <coughs> in this reliable case over this very small interval here your prediction um, saturates very quickly but uh, uh, yes I, I'm sure there's going to be a light coming on yeah. and there, there's some evidence now we see later that the infants are drawn to intermediate levels of predictability or not <coughs> <coughs> uh, to say I think to to be clear here, I, th I think in my model here, it's, it's the maximum unpredictability which causes the most salience. If I'm completely uncertain, maybe we, can, we, should, we should talk about this uh, at, uh, yeah, at lunch. Yeah. This is not, not exactly the same as novel salience, yeah. but I couldn't help but think of perhaps this is related to um, 
Are you familiar with literature on snack tagging and capture? Are you familiar with that? What, from um, uh, Gerstner's group? Or, well, it goes back to like Fry and Morris in okay. the 90s, but the, the basic yeah. finding was that you could potentiate weak learning along one synaptic pathway <coughs> by, um, uh, by um, inducing strong learning on another pathway that synapses on the same group of postsynaptic neurons. And yeah. the, the, the behavioral correlate of this, the hypothetical behavioral correlate of this has been that you can, if, that weak learning on some tasks can be enhanced by present, uh, having an animal exposed to some novelty either before or after that task. Right. So there's something about, um, the way that I thought of this is like, the, the novelty is casting a kind of penumbra over the yeah. other things that occur in yeah. a, a temporal, a temporal contiguity to it. Yeah. So it, it seems, that it might be really... It, may, it might be. So, so what you're saying then, it's... Um is, is that uh, temporal contiguity can, you can generalize. I, I, th I think if I'm in a salient position, the next thing is likely to be salient. That's, yeah, 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 that's yeah. right. But importantly, you're not generalizing, it's not like the generalization that I was talking about earlier. Right. It's really generalization about like, how much things are changing. Right, so how much uh, okay, about the world. yeah, okay. So you're measuring rates of change of something like change that. or something, yeah. yes, yeah, okay. So uh, I guess my question is a bit related to the political perspective. So at some point, you, you, I think I understood you explain that your system can account for, your, your model uh, can account for uh, the fact that white noise, white noise is not interesting very long. And so I was wondering... Well, I, I, um, that, that was a metaphor I, I started to introduce, which I, I didn't quite finish, but I, I said it was, a good, it was a good thing that we don't persistently engage with completely unpredictable stimuli because that's that's probably not ethologically a very good thing to do yeah because yeah. then because you uh, you know that some of us are using this notion of uh, learning progress or the rate of yeah. change yeah. of your model yeah. or the rate of yes. improvement of, yes. of your model as a, as a measure of, of, of salience and so I, I it was not clear to me whether uh, what what you are presenting is is compatible the same or different I, I hope it's compatible but I'm still trying to think about the, the mechanisms at some deeper level by which they, they might be related, but I, I think it's compatible, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about the, the last point about the, the details of the loading rules. And the, so, um, you know, as you know, one of the things I've looked at for a while is the, sort of the opposite learning rules in the D1 and D2 yeah. population, so I also like the Shen et al. data. Yeah, 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 yeah. But one of the things I was, you know, when we built these rate coded models, we didn't have models with STDP and yeah. didn't predict those effects. Um, but the, the general conclusion from those models is that there's essentially just a form of learning rules. And the one mm. difference that you said was that mm. the LTP, the D2 neurons, when there's a high dopamine state, instead of having LTD, which is what they would have had uh, in that yeah. simple idea that they have a mixture. And I'm wondering if that one sort of quadrant that makes the learning rule more complex is something that you've looked at its you know, functional significance. Yeah, so it turns out in our models, at least anyway, that um, in order to get good selection, which is nominally done through the sort of direct pathway or whatever, in order to get good selection, you also need um, some contribution from the D2 pathway. It kind of works synergistically, and so that's, that's kind of what I think comes out here, that if it had just gone flat or completely opposite, then... then, then so you want some regular LTP here going on that's, that's, that's consolidated and normalized, which is what you get with the textbook um, set of kernels, I think. That, that would be the, the, the story there. Yeah. So um, I would say some of, many of these neural details are complicated. So what yes. is the minimum set of rules? That the, the minimum set? Like well, Can in you explain everything just by the... The minimum set of rules is there's a continuum of rules. <laughs> if you like, depending on your level of dopamine, so there's dopamine along there and spike timing along there, yeah, so depending on where you are with your dopamine level you'll get a pair of exponentials that is your STDP set pair of kernels, yeah, and you pick off that pair of kernels according to this, um, this mixing thing here, yeah. So, so the, in terms of things, there's an infinite set of rules, but there, there's a well-ordered space of rules because they just picked off from this, uh, this, this simple morphing thing from one to the other. Yeah. And the, the opening level, can you just 
can it clearly exp uh, explained by the, the, the unpredictability. Yes. Yeah, so the, the so, so a, a, actually I've showed a, 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 a trajectory here as you progress through the experiment. So a dopamine burst would would correspond to something going on at the back of the diagram here. A dopamine dip corresponds to something going on at the front of the diagram here. Tonic levels are somewhere along here. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the phasic dopamine is driven by our prediction model. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. More questions? Okay, thank you.